Okay, recording has started, I believe. Do you want to introduce Andrew Jett? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Nelson Pintoneto, uh, welcome to our IQ seminar. Mm -hmm. uh, Nelson is from the Brazilian Center for Physics Research, and uh, he's quite well known in uh, the small circle of people who care about quantum foundations on the application of uh, pilot wave theory to cosmology and uh, quantum gravity. So, um, Nelson, this floor is yours. Okay. So, thank you very much, Nirit, and all of you for this invitation. Um, well, I will talk about this dialogue between quantum theory and cosmology, which has been very fruitful for both. Okay. So, uh, I will begin first by put some essentials of cosmology, and then I will go to the subject itself. Okay. So, cosmology... Um, are you seeing everything? It's okay. Okay. Yes. So uh, the standard cosmological model started with Fri uh, Alexander Friedman with his model in 1922. What Friedman did, uh, he took the equations of general relativity as they are, and the equation of general relativity just relates the geometry of uh, of uh, space and time to the energy momentum tensor of all the fields that are there. And just he took this, uh, this, uh, the Isis equations and you with, with uh, the so-called Copernicus principle was assuming that the, the, the spatial geometry should be homogeneous and isotropic, which in the beginning was just uh, something to, to simplify the, the, the equations, but then it proved to be the, uh, a good, a good, uh, uh, a good hint you know, for, for, for the space uh, geometry of the universe. And if you assume that, then uh, the unique degree of freedom for the background is this, this so-called scale factor, which gives the, the this distance, the, the space distance in this way. So this, this dx here are just the, the, the separation of coordinates. And for instance, if, if you think it's, it's not the, the unique model, but if you think the universe is a ball inflating or contracting, uh, the, the coordinates are just the latitude and longitude, and they get fixed. But if the, the ball is contracting or enlarging, uh, the distance are going to increase. And the, is this thing here, the scale factor, which gives this, uh, uh, this, uh, this notion of distance. Okay? So this is the unique degree of freedom in the case we assume that of course, and that there are also the degrees of freedom of matter, of course, but in the case of geometry, this, this is the unique degree of freedom if you assume that uh, space is homogeneous and isotropic. Um, so this model has been developed a lot. Okay, so the, uh, uh, Friedman found that uh, following Einstein's equations, the universe must be dynamical. It cannot be a static universe, uh, as it seemed before the observations. It could not be static. It must evolve, either expanding or contracting. And then in 1927, 1929, uh, Lemaitre and Hubble found that the universe was indeed expanding. Uh, this was the first uh, corroboration of the Friedman solution. And then if you think that the universe is, is expanding, if you go back to the past, it was uh, much, much smaller. If it was much, much smaller than the, all the constituents in the universe, was much more, the universe was much more dense, the temperature very high. And uh, Gamov and some others in 45 thought that at, at a very high temperature, uh, the universe was made by just protons and electrons. Uh, uh, ionized, just free protons and free electrons, uh, and the radiation around. And then they, when the universe cooled, uh, the first hydrogen atoms were formed, and then uh, uh, this radiation becomes free, and it should be there until now. Okay, and then in, in, uh, in 1964, Penzias and Wilson uh, measured this radiation, I put uh, this measured this radiation, and uh, it, uh, if they found it was really homogeneous and isotropic. Isotropic, I'm sorry. And indicating that the, the, 
the, uh, the early universe was really highly homogeneous and isotropic, but there should also be some anisotropies because the universe cannot be perfect homogeneous and isotropic because if not, you will not be here. Of course, there are planets, there are stars, there are galaxies, there are clusters of galaxies. And uh, so uh, there, there should have some small seeds of uh, inhomogeneities in, in at this time where the, 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 this radiation got free. And because of these seeds, there should be some small differences in temperature uh, of, the te of the, this, this background radiation uh, coming from this radiation, okay, of this epoch. And this was indeed observed in 92 by the Kobe satellite and then by many other experiments. The last one, the Planck satellite and everything agrees very well with the, the standard cosmological model, okay. Also, there is nuclear synthesis, uh, where if you go uh, uh, at high energies, um, uh, we could, uh, using the well-known nuclear physics that we know in the laboratories, and you apply this to the very early universe, you can calculate the abundance of, of uh, many light elements, like uh, the helium, the deuterium, uh, lithium, and then this seems to fit quite well with the observations. And finally, the formation of structures uh, with the, the seeds, the seeds that are uh, the, of, of inhomogeneities that were already present in the early universe. These seeds uh, increase and give rise to galaxies and cluster of galaxies for, for forming structures. And these things has been, have been calculated using uh, numerical calculations and, and and so and it fits quite well with what we observe. Okay, so uh, the, the 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 standard cosmological model initiated by Friedman and developed by a lot of people has a, has a lot of successes. But there is a very deep problem, which is the problem of the initial singularity. So all Friedman models contain one initial singularity. If you go back to the past. This scale factor goes to zero. And if the scale factor goes to zero, all distance of between all particles goes to zero. And so the density goes to infinite, the curvature of space time goes to infinite. And so this is a singularity where no physics is possible. And this was one of the reasons that Einstein rejected the Friedman solution at the beginning. But then when he was forced to accept it, he claimed that the initial singularity was just uh, general relativity pointing as its own limits of, of applicability. Well, uh, what he was, he was trying to say is that at this near this point, some new physics should be appear, should appear. So, some uh, modifications of Einstein equations, like we say, curvature square terms, and also uh, quantum effects. So, if you are and getting very close to the singularity, all the scales becomes very small, the, the energies become very high, and it's plausible that quantum effects become very important, not only for matter fields, but also for gravitation and for geometry itself. And so people begin to think that uh, uh, quantum effects should uh, perhaps uh, be good to understand what happens near the singularities okay? and perhaps solve the singularity problem. Okay? Now, the problem is that there is a conceptual problem is that, well, if you apply uh, quantum theory to the whole universe, there is a, there is a problem. Uh, does quantum cosmology make sense? So if you stay strictly in the, in the with the Copenhagen interpretation, which uh, it needs a classical domain with classical observers and classical apparatus to give a sense to the, to, 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 to the quantum measurement, uh, then it's impossible because if you quantize the whole universe, there is no classical domain outside the whole, the whole universe if it is quantized, okay? So we have, so if you stay strictly with the companion interpretation, we have a really, a very deep conceptual problem. And I think, uh, uh, 
this example is a good example of something that Einstein said by the 40s, uh, which I think is, is very nice. He said, well, contemporary quantum theory, which I think is the, uh, the compare interpretation, constitutes some optimum formulation of certain connections, but offers no useful point of departure for future development. So uh, I think this is a very good example of, of, uh, of how this come about. Huh? Fortunately, there are alternative quantum theories uh, which were developed later, right? There is the many world inter interpretation, the many world quantum theory, the consistent histories approach, the spontaneous collapse approach, and the broadly bond approach, which is the one which I will follow. Uh, I know a little bit about the others, but uh, at least to me, it seems that the broadly bond is the one that get that is, is simpler to apply to the universe, at least to me. And uh, so I will I will uh, focus on the Broly bond uh, uh, approach to quantum theory, and then apply it to to to, to, to cosmology. Okay. So in order to introduce the Broly bond theory, uh, I will use the words of Bell. Okay, John Stuart Bell, and I think his introduction is very nice. What he says is that, well, the kinematics of the world in this orthodox picture, which, which is the Copenhagen picture, right? Is given by a wave function for the quantum part and classical variables, variables which have values in the sense that uh, they, are, they, are, they are real, they are actual, they have absolute reality for the classical part. So the size and X, the X are somehow macroscopic. This is not spelled out very explicitly. The dynamics is not very precisely formulated either. It includes a Schrodinger equation for the quantum part and some sort of classical mechanics for the classical part and collapse results for their interaction. It seems to me that the only hope of precision with the dual Psi X kinematics is to omit completely the shift split and let both Psi and X refer to the world as a whole. Then the X must not be confined to some vague microscopic scale, but must extend to all scales. Uh, so if you, for instance, I, I will put, uh, I will exemplify with the non-relativistic non quantum mechanics. So the X should be, for instance, the position of a quantum particle. So what he's saying is that the position of quantum particle is something that is also a quantum variable and it has a, uh, it has some reality, it's actual, it has some objective reality. And so it's part of the description of a quantum particle, quantum non relativity particle, in the case of, of quantum particles. Okay, you can extend this to fields also. Um, so, uh, so as we are now trying to describe the, a, quantum, uh, a quantum particle by not, not only by its wave function, but also by its position, then we need some equation for the position. Huh? And that's what was done by, for, by De Broglie and then, and then uh, reformulated and uh, improved by Bohm. So the equations, for, this is just non-relativistic quantum mechanics, but it can, as I said, this can be extended to field theory. Uh, so for Psi, this is just the, the, for, uh, it's just a Schrodinger equation. It doesn't change anything. And uh, for, for, uh, for the positions, uh, we get that the momentum of the particle, the mx dot, is given by the gradient of the phase of the wave function. In fact, it was formulated a little bit different. Uh, it's, it is said that the velocity of the particle, the field velocity of the particle is given by, uh, by the, the probability, probability current. But uh, anyway, I think this is uh, I think easy to, to understand. Uh, so this is, this is the equation for, for for, for the velocities. And uh, so if you integrate this, the first order equations, if you integrate this, there is a, a constant integration, which is the initial position. And this should be the, the hidden variable of the theory is the initial position, okay? Um, now, why this is sensible? Because uh, uh, so if you write the wave function in a polar form, and A here is the norm of psi and S is the phase, uh, we have two equations here, two equations. The first one for the phase is, is, a, is like the hamilton jacob equation for S, which supplemented by an extra term, which 
comes from A here for the normal psi. And this extra term here, Bohm called the quantum potential because it's, this is the thing which makes the departure from classical physics. Why? Because if this term here is very, very small compared to the others, this is just the, the, the hamilton jacob equation. And if you then you can integrate and have hamilton jacob function. And if you put here, you have the classical trajectory. What gives the difference is, is the, this term here. So, so this is the term which gives the quantum effect. Now there is this other equation here, which is a continuity equation for normal psi square. Uh, we should think that, uh, okay, you have uh, this, uh, so psi should describe an ensemble of, of quantum particles. And, um, and what we don't know is the initial position. Okay? And this, uh, so, it, could think this, uh, uh, if you integrate this, you can think of if this is a velocity field, gradient of S of M is some kind of velocity field. And this would be a continuity equation um, of this ensemble of particles with just such velocity field. Okay. Now, one thing that's very important, if we assume that the distribution of initial positions Okay, the distribution, this is initial position. The distribution of initial positions, or is the position that t equals zero, is exactly norm of psi square. Then we can show that the probability of finding a particle at any time will be exactly norm of psi square at this time. And all the statistical predictions of quantum mechanics are recovered. So if you make this assumption, then the probability of finding a particle at any time should be given by a normal psi square. However, this, um, this assumption here is, um, is not, uh, could be relaxed. Uh, there's nothing logical in saying this. So people try to think about the possibility and in which the probability of, of initial positions in the beginning are not normal psi square. Then many people, initiated, this is a work initiated by Valentini and there are, there are many others, uh, explore the situation and they show using some uh, analysis of the age theorem of uh, statistical mechanics, which shows that um, the system goes to the state of maximum entropy. Uh, they say that in a cross graining level, uh, the probability of finding a particle at some time t in position x becomes approximate, approximately uh, normal psi square. Uh, this is not a really a theorem because uh, it's not been proved, uh, but under very, very general conditions, very uh, uh, suitable conditions uh, of continuity and many other things, uh, this indeed happened and, uh, and even if you say that in the beginning, or at some time t equals zero, the, the probability, uh, the, the distribution of initial position is not psi square. Uh, in the end, it re rapidly relaxed to normal psi square. So it indicates that maybe the Born rule may be obtained and not postulated, but it's something under debate yet. And there are many examples and where this works quite well. Okay, and also if you relax this, then there is a possibility that you, you could find some situations in nature where this relaxation did not happen, and then you could perhaps differentiate this approach of quantum mechanics to usual quantum mechanics because this does not happen. If you could explore uh, this the situation here, this. Then, uh, of course, we will have an observation, an experiment will, which will differentiate uh, uh, this formulation of quantum theory to the usual formulation of quantum theory. Okay, this is something interesting. Okay, but there are some debates on this, and that's the situation of the of, uh, of this. Now, about concerning the, the measurement problem, uh, well, in the usual formulation, uh, for instance, if you have uh, the wave function of uh, 
of uh, the observer system and everything around it, the apparatus and everything around it. Uh, when the, the, the apparatus interact with the system and you think about the coheres and all these things, then the wave function uh, bifurcating the two possibilities, for instance, the case of the Schrodinger cat, dead or alive, then they bifurcate in both, in both possibilities. Uh, so, but uh, there is, we see only one thing and uh, you cannot uh, uh, in any way, this is the work of von Neumann and many others, you cannot in any way uh, select one single branch. And then there is in the middle, there is some collapse postulate that say, well, at some point, uh, one of the branch postulates and there is only one branch that survives. And this collapse cannot be de de described by Schrodinger equation. And so that's, that's the way we learn, I think, in our course of quantum mechanics. Now, if you are in the, the, the broadly bond theory, uh, we, uh, now you don't have only the wave function, you have also the, the, the particle, right? The, 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 pos the particle position in configuration space. No doubt the configuration space is very large. There's a lot of degrees of freedom because it can, yeah, yeah, the, the, the configuration space should um, uh, describe all the particles involved in the measurement. So, uh, so there is a particle in configuration space and this particle has a real, has a, a, an actual trajectory. And depending on the initial conditions, right, it will take one of the branches. And this breaks the symmetry here. This breaks completely the symmetry. And so this branch here will, will be different from this branch here. And this, it can be proved, and Bond did that, it can be proved that the, the, the empty uh, branch is not uh, detectable. It's not detectable by any possible de detector. Okay. And so uh, here we have uh, 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 this branch is selected, but we don't need to postulate a collapse uh, in order to get rid of the uh, get rid in between quotes of the other branch because uh, the particle itself, the, part, the particle in configuration, spell, in configuration space selected this branch as the one branch that is, uh, and this depends on the initial, uh, on the initial conditions uh, that you don't have control. Okay. And uh, so some remarks, uh, this quantum potential is highly non-local, so uh, they're context dependent. Uh, so Bell's inequalities are violated, like usual quantum mechanics. It offers a simple characterization of the classical limit, which just uh, when k goes to zero are very small. Probabilities, as I said, are not fundamental in this theory. They are secondary aspect and, uh, and they are known variable is the initial position. And it is a, a quantum theory with objective reality, but with the same statistical prediction of standard quantum theory. And just finalizing, uh, just a comment about the trajectories. Well, when, when, I, when I first learned uh, quantum mechanics, uh, people told me, and in the books, many books, people told me that uh, uh, the, uh, the quantum interference uh, shows that you cannot even think about quantum trajectories. You cannot even think about that. Well, but if you apply all this, machin uh, this machinery to, to to, to the two-digit experiment, you see, so if you, if you, if you throw some electrons uh, to a two-digit experiment and, and the initial uh, wave functions just are just Gaussians around this two-digit here, this is it here and this is here, this is the initial wave function. And then you calculate the wave function at any time and then you have the phase and then you calculate the trajectories. Then you can show that the, the trajectories have this form here yeah. And you see that uh, in, in this screen, you have, you obtain an interference pattern. And uh, the trajectories are here. So what people say, you cannot even think about trajectories, simply not, not true. They can think about trajectories. Perhaps they are, not, they are not there, they are useless or some, okay, this, this uh, can be said, but we can think about trajectories. And then this, uh, when I first saw this, this remind me uh, another, another remark of Bell, 
and when in his book, Speak People and Speak and Speak About Quantum Mechanics. And he said, in 1952, I saw the impossible done. It was in the papers by David Bond. The subjectivity of the orthodox version, the necessary reference to the observer could be eliminated. But why then had Bohr not told me of this pirate wave? If only to point, to point out what was wrong with it. Why did von Neumann not consider it? Why is the pilot wave picture ignored in textbooks? Should it not be taught, not as the only way, but as an antidote to the prevailing complacence, to show us that vagueness, subjectivity, and indeterminism are not forced on us by experimental facts, but by deliberate theoretical choice? I think it is a very important remark. So now I will apply this to to cosmology and to give a notion to the wave function of the universe. Okay. And so let me go. <laughs> if, if someone has some questions, so please tell me, okay? Uh, I am here for, for answer any questions if, if you want. So I will then go to, to cosmology. And now I, I will try to interpret, interpret the wave function of the universe in terms of this approach here. So let me go. So the wave function universe. So let, let me, don't, uh, uh, this is simple, okay? Uh, so here is the Hamiltonian of everything, okay? Just, just in a schematic, schematic way, okay? As, as every, you know, so now we are thinking about field theory, okay? That's why there is this integration here. So these are fields, okay? And uh, if you the Hamiltonian of, of gravity and all the other fields in the universe are necessarily a combination of two constraints, okay? A, this H0 here and this HI here, I goes from one to three, and this N here and NI here as Lagrange multipliers. And H here represents the geometry of space, okay? By H represents the momentum that I conjugate to the geometry of space. Phi represents all matter fields, okay? It's just a schematic way. And pi phi represents all the momenta uh, of, 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 of uh, related to, 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 to the matter fields, okay? The same thing here, okay? And so note that this can be very complicated, but anyway, it's not important for us. Now, the, 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 the classical equations comes from the Hamilton equations, which uh, the, time, the, the time evolution of age uh, is given by the Poisson break between age and Hamiltonian, the same thing for, for, for the, the matter fields, the same thing for the moment, and the same thing for, for, for the, the moment conjugated conjugated to, to phi. Now, as this is a theory uh, with constraint, the, the quantization, uh, you must apply the Dirac quantization and using the rules of the Dirac quantization, the, uh, the wave function must be annihilated by the constraints, the operator version of the constraints. These are so must be annihilated by these two. And also, uh, there has to be a Schoenberg equation, but as age is a combination of these constraints, okay, and as the constraints annihilate psi, then psi does not depend on time, on any external time. Okay? Psi does not depend on any external time. Okay? So how do the broadly bound theory deals with that? So with this psi, uh, with this equation here, I can get a solution, okay? When you get a solution, you can calculate the phase of the solution, get the phase of the solution, then using the, 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 the guidance equations, you can calculate the evolution of the geometry and the matter fields. Okay? Now, we can compare these equations to these equations here. So uh, if you compare this equation, this equation the, the, to the other equation here, uh, Goldstein, Goldstein and Zhang, they proposed then that like a Hamiltonian, 
The way functional universe is law-like, it's nomological. It gives the law of evolution of everything in the universe. So that's the proposition. The wave function of the universe is nomological, law-like. It gives the evolution of everything in the universe. It's not about probabilities. Well, it seems quite sensible as you are talking about a single system, which is the whole universe and everything that's inside it. Uh, also, we don't need to seek for a probability measure, which is something it's quite difficult when we we talk about the Willard equation and, and many other equations, quantum equations that are in the, in the literature. And it's natural that the equation for the wave function of the universe does not involve time. So in the end, that the wave function of the universe does not involve time. However, there is uh, something that must be done because this proposal is not completed, is that uh, as psi comes from some equations, there are many solutions. So what is the law for the universe? So we, we should uh, expect that this law should be unique. So we need some boundary conditions to these equations here, which leads to a single solution, which would give the, the laws which governs the universe as a whole, okay? Uh, and there are some proposals. I think you haven't heard about this. Uh, the, the, there is the Hart or Hawking proposal, which is so called the, the no boundary condition. There is a tunneling condition by Alexander Vilenkin and some others. Uh, but this is still under debate. Okay? It's, not a, it's not a close subject. Now, how probabilities arise in, in this theory? Well, the probabilities, probabilities arise in subsystems contained in, in the universe which is quite sensible because if you have subsystems, then you have many, 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 many subsystems in the universe, then you can talk about probabilities of having such subsystem or not just other subsystems. Okay? And this can be done in, 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 in the, the broad approach by using the so-called conditional wave function. What is the conditional wave function? So let us suppose that the wave, the, the universe is composed by only two fields, phi one and phi two. Only two fields phi one and phi two. And psi is the wave function of the universe for, for these two fields. Now, suppose one gets the moment trajectory for phi one, and then we have phi one of t. Now, if you substitute this here, you have, so if you make the substitution, you have the so-called conditional wave function, which is a function of time and phi two. And this conditional wave function gives everything you can know about phi two, no problem. It's okay. It gives everything you might know about phi two. But it can be proved in many circumstances, and we have proved also in cosmology, that the original equation for psi even does not, even not involving time, not a, even being completely different from the equation, becomes a Schoenner equation for this conditional wave function. And once it becomes a Schoenner equation for this conditional wave function, then all I discuss with you, quantum equilibrium and that psi squares should be a probability measure can be applied. And then for this conditional wave function, which describes some subsystems, uh, we can give some notion of probability and we could have a probability measure. So uh, that's the picture that, uh, uh, emerge from the De Broglie-Bohm quantum theory. This is not the unique one. There are other people interpreting things in a different way, but this is the, the way I prefer using the De Broglie-Bohm quantum theory. Okay. So uh, I will now apply all these things to concrete examples in cosmology. Uh, so if you want, want to, to make some more questions, I am at, dis at your disposal whenever you want. So let me apply them to, to, some, to some situation in cosmology. Well, don't, don't be uh, afraid of what, uh, I will try to explain everything qualitatively and I think you will understand. Now, one thing that's very important for cosmology is the evolution of scalar perturbations and the quantum to classical transition. Um, because uh, as I told you, uh, the, 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 uh, 
there are some seeds of inhomogeneities in the early universe, which are very small. And so they are described by small fields. Okay, small fields is, is a small field. It's phi here is much, much less than one. Okay, here is the scale factor. This F eta here is the so-called conformal time. As in general relativity, we have uh, this uh, freedom to choose what uh, uh, variable should be, should be should, we, we can use to make the role of time. And, and this so-called conformal time is very practical, very useful. So this eta here is a time like the, the cosmic time, but uh, it's called conformal time and everything is simple, simpler if you use this time, okay? So the geometry then is given by, okay, the scale factor and this perturbation here, which, uh, which uh, will give rise to all structures in the universe. We can show that this phi here uh, in the non-relativistic limit is related to the Newtonian potential. Okay. Of course, there is some matter fields. I would describe these matter fields by a scalar field. And uh, the scalar field is there is a background value, which I call phi, okay? And this delta phi, which depends on x, depends on the spatial coordinates, okay? And because the theory has a lot of, of, of gauge, uh, Gauge symmetries. There is a gate invariant variable, which is the so called Nukanasazak variable, where the evolution of the perturbation becomes very simple and, and conceptually very clear. And in the end, what is important here is this equation here for the modes of this field here. Okay, note that these are things that depend on space, these are fields, they are small fields. Uh, the perturbations, and these are the questions for the modes. It is a, this case, the mode is one of the scale. And this Z here is something depending on the background. Say this is uh, phi over age here. I didn't tell you age here is a dot over a is the derivative of the scale factor uh, divided by a itself. Okay, so it's is a is a background uh, a background uh, uh, variable. Okay. So for the modes, as you can see, uh, uh, we have almost like a, 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 a harmonic oscillator, but there is this time dependent thing here. Okay. So there are two regimes. There is one regime that this becomes very, this is, dominates over this thing, and then you have really, uh, uh, harmonic oscillator, uh, and the regime where these dominate over this, and then uh, there is amplification of the, the perturbation and all this thing. Okay. Uh, now, what usually people think is that when this is uh, this is much bigger than this, is the situation where the perturbations are. Uh, the length of the perturbation or the scale of the perturbation is much, much smaller than the, the, cow, the causal uh, length of the universe or the, the curvature scale of the universe. So it's a situation where the scale does not fuel cosmology, does not fuel the expansion of the universe. In this situation, this is really just like a harmonic oscillator. And, uh, and what these guys, they were the first, Mekanov was the first uh, uh, postulate is that at this, in this situation, the only thing that you have as inhomogeneities are quantum vacuum fluctuations. So what they try to do, they try to quantize this field here and say, well, this field in this uh, past, in this infinite past, uh, was very, very small, they, and the only thing that was there was quantum vacuum fluctuations of these fields. Then we let them evolve, and the modes evolve according to this equation, and you try to see what it gives. And in fact, it gives very, very good results, which are in complete accordance to all observations. And so the idea that all uh, inhomogeneities in the universe arose from 
quantum vacuum fluctuations of these inhomogeneous fields is something that uh, people, I think everybody agrees nowadays and, and, uh, and all the consequences of that are confirmed by observation. Okay. But there is a problem. The problem is the following. How oh, this is the, 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 the way found, now this is the, the Schrodinger equation for these modes, okay? Uh, Tom, you must, uh, should, you must calculate this. And the solution for the vacuum state is this one here, where you see here is, a, is the field, okay? It's a, the mode of the field. And this guy here is, is a solution of this equation here. It's just a classical equation. But in order to be a, a vacuum state, uh, it must satisfy this, uh, this, this, this uh, condition that when this thing here is much bigger than G2 primary Z, then it must satisfy this, uh, it must uh, have this form. So if you have this, you, don't, you have what is F of K and you have everything and then you can calculate, calculate everything and that's okay, that's very nice. However, uh, there is a problem that nobody, nobody, many people, do not talk, but it's very important. The vacuum state is homogeneous and isotropic. And so for instance, the mean, the mean value of the field should, is zero. Also, the mean value of the V square is homogeneous as, uh, because as the vacuum state is homogeneous isotropic. So if you do simple calculation, you can show this. Another point, well, this is, the fluctuations of temperature in the background radiation. Okay, this is the, the, the fluctuations of the temperature over the mean value of the temperature. Okay, now these fluctuations in the end are given by these perturbations, the, 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 this, the, this geometry, geometrical perturbations here. Okay, but if you have quantized everything, what should I put here? Should I put the mean value? But the mean value is zero. No, I cannot put the mean value. So I put a realization of this quantum variable. Well, this is a question and people try to solve this question by saying that, well, when, there is the, the, when the evolution takes place, uh, there is a squeezing of the, the, the state and the then you, can, you find some positive, some positive vignette distribution in phase space, and the quantum distribution looks like classical stochastic distribution of realization of the universe with different inhomogeneous configuration, and the coherence avoids in interference among realization. However, this was very much criticized by many authors, uh, including myself, because first, the state is still homogeneous and isotropic, it doesn't change. What is the environment of the perturbation in the universe in order to realize the coherence? In the standard interpretation, different potentialities or these different uh, branches here are not realities. How one of the potentialities become our universe? And what makes the role of a measurement in, when, if you think of uh, in these terms, what makes the role of, the, of a measurement? What makes the collapse of the wave function in one of these uh, configurations? Okay. Uh, well, uh, we cannot collapse the wave function because we cannot exist without star because this, this must be, this must happen before the formation because the stars and galaxies are classical objects. So everything I said must happen before there are any observers or any something. Must, uh, or something like this. So this is really a point. This is the measurement problem in cosmology. Okay. Now, uh, if you go to the De Broglie bond theory, then the situation becomes much more clear. First of all, there is an actual field configuration which breaks the translation and rotational invariance in the same way that, that, that I show you that there, that, that here, the, the, the the, the, the two branches are, are, are singularized by this, 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 uh, uh, by this, uh, this point position in configuration space. The same thing here. The actual fit configuration breaks translation and rotation imbalance. And also the perturbations obeys 
the guidance equations, and you can calculate. So I, 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 with my colleagues, we calculated the evolution of the perturbations, okay? Uh, here is the quantum perturbation. And here is, here is the classical one. So they are not exactly the classical one. This is complex fields. They are not exactly the classical one. Okay. And you have two regimes. Uh, you have, so this is, this is the calculation that we did. This is the solution. How we get the solution? We got the phase of the wave function and you use the guidance relations, which is this one here. It's not a little bit more complex because it's a complex field and there are some subtleties here. But we took the, 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 the phase, we calculated the, the, the trajectory and the solution is this solution here. Okay. And, but when, when, uh, when K, K squared is much bigger than Z2 prime regime, is the regime where you have just a harmonic oscillator. The classical solution is just, a, is just an oscillatory uh, function of time. And if you look here, as B of K is just, uh, it's just almost a constant. Okay? So they are completely different. So uh, at the beginning, the field is really quantum. But when you get into the regime where K squared is much less than Z to primary Z, then uh, this solution is a power law. Okay? This is calculated by many ways in cosmology. And as it is a power law, if you put here, the quantum uh, field uh, is also a power law. So it becomes equal to the classical field. So uh, when you are in this regime, the Bohmian trajectory is different. The Bohmian, the Bohmian field is different from the classical field. But when we enter in this new regime, which is the regime then we, we give rise to the to all structures in the universe, the barometer X become, becomes the classical, uh, uh, the classical field or uh, the classical mode, which will give rise to the structures in the universe. So they become classical. So uh, using the broadly bond theory, you have a very nice description of the quantum classical transition. Uh, finally, just the last thing, I think, I hope. <laughs> Uh, no, there are two things. Uh, what about the background? Well, I talked a lot, a lot about perturbations and what about the background? So let us think, uh, at the, well, there are many examples. I, I focus in, in just a simple example, which is a situation when you have just uh, the, the, uh, the geometry, the, the, isotropic, the homogeneous and isotropic geometry and the scalar field. This alpha here is log of A. Uh, the Hamiltonian of the system coming from GR, coming from general relativity, is a constraint, and this constraint contains the momentum canonically conjugated to alpha uh, of sort of A, the momentum canonically conjugated to phi, which is scalar field, and there is a potential. Okay? So now uh, we quantize the quantization, the H0 must annihilate psi. You can find solutions for this, the solution of the phase, and the phase is the bond trajectory that you can calculate. And this is the results that we obtained already in the year 2000. Okay. So let me try to make you understand what's going on here. Okay. First of all, if you have a scalar field with the potential, if you get near the singularity, the kinetic term dominates over everything, or over, dominates over the potential term. And the, the scalar field behaves as what is called a stiff matter. It's a, something with a pressure so, so high that is at the same order of magnitude as the energy density. And so this so-called stiff matter. Okay? In this situation, the scalar field uh, the classical terrestrial scalar field obeys this equation here. So uh, if you are just uh, using classical relativity with homogeneous and isotropic uh, geometries and a scalar field, these are the classical trajectories. So 
you have a classical trajectory that you go up to minus infinite. So alpha is going to minus infinite. Alpha going to minus infinite means A equals zero, so it's a singularity. Or you have this, uh, you have uh, this possibility here, which is if you go back in time, alpha go to minus infinite because these are the classical trajectories. Alpha equal plus phi or alpha equal minus phi plus constant. Okay. And so uh, it's a, a solution which has a singularity. Now, the solution that we obtain from the wave function calculated here is like this. So we have a universe contracting classically. You see this is alpha equal uh, minus V classically. It should go to a singularity, but because of quantum effects, it is hotted. And then it's launched to the expanding phase. So the singularity solves. There is no singularity. There is a bounce here. There is no singularity. And this is obtained using uh, this moment trajectories. This is also obtained. This was was also obtained by some other approach to quantum gravity, like loop quantum, loop quantum cosmology. And the solutions are very much similar. Very very much similar. So for the backgrounds, you have this uh, bounce and the singularity is solved. Okay. And now for, for taking account the perturbations, so it's, uh, I, I don't know if, uh, uh, so take, uh, having, having this background solution, if you go, if you take the wave function for the perturbations, you can now, uh, yeah, and uh, define the conditional wave function by just putting the background solution here. And then this is an equation. This is a, this is a wave function depending on the perturbation and on the conformal time. And we have shown, we have shown, this is, this is a work that we have shown in some papers that the equation for this is exactly the same equation as before, but now, this background, the, 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 the Z here, which is, uh, is, a, a back, is a background function, is a background function related to the Bohmian trajectory of the background without singularity. Okay. And you have calculated everything about the perturbations and you have realized that what, 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 what the observations say, the observations say this is the so-called spectral index. This spectral index, uh, the observation says that this is spectral index is, it must be close to one, okay? And we uh, and have calculated everything and have shown that this spectral index depends on uh, the ratio between the pressure and the energy density. And in order for this to be of order one, then W should be zero. So what should dominate the contracting phase should be some kind of field which has pressure almost zero. And this is nothing but dark matter. Dark matter has exactly this property. So we have a model uh, where the contracting phase is dominated by dark matter. And if, it is, if this is so, then the spectral index is almost like one, like observation say. Okay. And uh, finally, the last thing I would like to show you is that, uh, well, uh, I think that uh, I'm almost in time. The last thing I'd like to show you is something very interesting. It's because everything I, I told you, um, yeah, well, continue here. Uh, I, well, now then uh, you, you took a specific example of a exponential potential. And this exponential potential has very, many motivations coming from string theory, many, there are many motivations for, for, for exponential potential. So if you have an exponential potential, then the background works as follows. So the scalar field behaves as dark matter in the far past of the contacting phase, then behaves as stiff matter around the bounce, as I said, and uh, then there is the bounce, and then far in the expanding phase, it behaves like dark energy, which is very nice, 
does it have a behavior like that? And then in the infinite future, it behaves again as a, 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 a normal method of W equals zero. Okay. The problem with all these models is that, well, they give nice uh, spectral index, but if you stay just in classical or extensions of classical relativity, the ratio between the gravitational waves and, and uh, scalar perturbations or the ratio between gravitation, primordial gravitational waves and scalar perturbations, which give rise to all the structures in the universe, are very high. And the observations say that this ratio must be less than 0 0.1. Now, uh, we have shown that this guy here is just a scalar perturbation, and this guy here is gravitational waves. Uh, this x here is just def defy the, the alpha, it's a background variable. Okay? And both evolve in this way, both evolve according to this integral here. In the classical uh, extension of general relativity, this, act, this x here is not, is always close to one. So that's why these two fields here are almost the same. And that's what we calculated by numerical calculations. So you see that both fields have evolved, they, 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 they oscillate, and then they, are, they begin to increase, begin to increase, but near the bounds where the quantum effects are really relevant, then these color perturbations become uh, more important. And then you can have that the ratio between tensor perturbations and scalar perturbations are less than 0 0.1 as observed. So because of the, the, the of this quantum effect, we have obtained a very nice result that uh, the tensor perturbations are really smaller than the scalar perturbations. Okay, let me summarize everything. Uh, well, uh, just to summarize these things, so the, the quantum bounce was fundamental for that, not only to the connection between them, uh, but because the quantum effects can need large scalar perturbations with respect to tensor perturbations, which does not happen in classical models with a single fluid. So let me, let me end, okay? So what I try to show you is that the De Broglie quantum theory is very suitable for quantum cosmology. Uh, it, gives rise to an interpretation that psi is nomological and probabilities are secondary. They come uh, by, uh, in subsystem, subsystems by using this conditional wave function. Uh, it explains in a very simple way a very old controversy concerning cosmological perturbations of quantum mechanical origin that comes on the classical transition. And so we have shown you that Basically, general relativity and the broader bond quantum theory yield a sensible bouncy model, which can explain the origin of cosmological perturbations in accordance with observations. And in such models, inflation can be present, but it's not necessary. Uh, there are testable consequences of quantum cosmology, which we are searching for. And this can, uh, by the so called non Gaussianity, entropy perturbations, the situations where you have the, in cosmology, where you have departure from quantum equilibrium and the probabilities in the broadly bond theory are not exactly precise square. And, and this may happen in the early universe and it may be testable. And so finally, just to, just to, to tell you, well, quantum theory really helped cosmology because for instance, it solved the cosmological singularity problem. And cosmology is also can help quantum theory because it can offer a possible arena to test different quantum theories. Okay. And finally, and last thing, it was present a quantum cosmological effect with sizable observational consequence, which is the thing that I show you, uh, which is this effect here. Okay. Uh, of course, there are other, there are alternative explanations for this in other theories, inflation and all this thing, but it's interesting that uh, in this framework, the only way to so to save this model is through uh, this uh, quantum cosmological approach using the broad bond theory. So, okay, I, I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks, Nancy. Um, so, uh, do we have uh, questions from the audience? Okay. Um, all right, I don't see anything in the chat. So I think like basically we have had uh, like few less people in uh, the audience today because it's last week of the semester. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, like I have few questions. Like, um, like Nelson, do you think like the like the pilot wave picture like naturally then like uh, suggests a bouncing universe uh, model over like other possibilities in the cosmological scenario? No. Uh, um... Using the pilot wave theory, uh, these bounces are very clear, okay? And you, uh, in many situations, you obtain these bounces. But there are other approaches using other interpretations, which also have bounces. And more, many of them using the uh, loop quantum cosmology approach. Uh, and they also have bounces and they, study the bounces and all these things. Well, my, uh, my, my difference with them is that they also, uh, they, they, they have bounces, but they also have inflation. And as I told you, what I think is interesting is that when you have a bounce, you don't need inflation. It's not that that inflation cannot be there, but you don't need inflation. No. So I think it's more interesting to, to study a model uh, without inflation, uh, and see what does it give, what what it gives, okay? because you don't need inflation. Inflation is very important for uh, uh, if you think that the universe really had a beginning. If the universe really had a beginning, inflation is very important and fundamental. But if the universe did not have a beginning, then inflation is not necessary. It can be there, but it's not necessary. Uh, but usually people from, from loop quantum cosmology, they study bounds and subsequently there is some inflationary error. And I usually stay, I, I usually stay just with the bounds and see what happens. Okay. But of course there are all, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in loop quantum cosmology, they also use the consistent histories approach and uh, using this approach, they also obtain some bouncing models there, okay? But mm -hmm. using the consistent history approach. Okay, thanks. I think there is a question in the chat uh, from Andrew. The answer, like what has been the reaction from the wider community to your explanation of dark matter? Well, and then the same, what is the explanation of? What has been the reaction? What has been the reactions from the wider community uh, to your explanations of dark matter? Um, it's a question posed by Andrew. Uh -huh. What the, uh, the, the com what which community? I didn't understand the community. Uh, uh, Andrew, would you like to like uh, further elaborate on a question? Should be okay. Let me see. Uh, ah, from the European of dark matter. Ah, okay, okay. Now no, I understand. I understand now. Okay, uh, no, I, I'm not. Um, I'm not explaining dark matter. I am. I'm just using dark matter uh, uh, to to uh, in my model. Well, because well, look, uh, in this uh, bouncing model, what we need to have is a, a field which behaves like dark matter behaves like dark matter. If the field behaves like dark matter, then everything goes well. And that's very nice because dark matter, it seems to be there. There are many, many, many observations indicating that dark matter is there. So in this model, uh, we don't need to use any other field like the inflaton because in inflation, indeed another, another field that's not observed, the inflaton. Uh, you don't need this. You just need to have dark matter. And if dark matter is there, then 
and, do, and, it, and if it dominates the contracting phase, then uh, uh, all perturbation satisfies the observations as we see it. Uh, of course, in the bounce itself, there must be some particle creation, some uh, biogenesis in order to give rise to, 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 to us. You are bionics, you are made by bionics, right? And we have calculated all these things and these things think, seems to work well. You know? But this is, a, this is a problem for everybody, okay? How is biogenesis? What happens in budgets? But um, I'm just using dark matter in my model uh, and using the properties that uh, everybody knows about uh, dark matter. You see, nothing more than that. I'm not uh, explaining dark matter. I'm not saying that dark matter is. Uh, I'm not giving a, a reason for why dark matter exists. Okay, I just take dark matter, put in my model, and it works very well. Okay, that's it. I don't know if I answered Andrew, but. Yeah. Um. Okay, I have uh, one other question. Like, it seems in the cosmological like model, like you were um, using the wave function, like uh, as living in, like as described in the Fourier modes. Uh, the wave function had like uh, the Fourier modes, and uh, I was wondering, like, if you need to like uh, discretize the modes, because otherwise you would have like a continuous infinity of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, also, if you need to like impose uh, an upper limit uh, for how large uh, can like the value of k can be. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, well, you uh, you because uh, let me. Uh, no, well, oh, 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 one. When you write the wave function in these terms, in terms, because there is a wave function, all right, uh, you are able to, to, to separate the wave function in terms of wave function for each mode. Uh, when uh, we are dealing with just perturbations in the linear regime. Uh, when we have perturbations in, non, the, in the non linear regime, the situation is much more complicated. I cannot present the way in the in this thing the way I showed you. Now, uh, well, yes, the, 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 the case, the case here, where we usually make some, uh, some small box and then uh, uh, you, you separate in this way, but this box can be made as smaller as I want. So, um, I think in the case of linear perturbations, I think there is no problem with that. But in the case of non-linear perturbation, when you have uh, non-linear uh, interactions between the perturbations, uh, then, then uh, this approach uh, must be much, much more involved. Uh, you can change, you must change the things. Okay. Yeah, and in general, like if you are applying like a pilot wave theory, like we need to have the Schrodinger picture. And uh, like in normal yes. realistic quantum mechanics, like uh, we always have a finite number of um, uh, variables in the configuration space. Um, whereas um, we can have like momenta extending to infinity um, mm -hmm. in general, uh, unless we impose a like, ultraviolet cutoff. Mm -hmm. So is it that we, uh, what would you, like, where do we exactly place the cutoff so that we can have a sensible mm -hmm. uh, Schrodinger picture to use in parallel with theory? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. The, the Schrodinger picture can be applied in many circumstances. Um, uh, I don't know if, if I don't know if you know this uh, book of Schwerber and other books of uh, Hartfield. Um, 
Well, these problems of cutoff uh, and uh, normalization also happens in, a, in, a, in the Heisenberg picture. And we just uh, use the same type of cutoffs and uh, randomization procedures in the Schoenke picture. It's, it's not very different. Uh, uh, so everything with, with what is done in the Heisenberg picture, with the cutoffs and the, the, the randomization procedure, uh, in the end can be done in the Schoenke picture. But uh, in this situation here, where we are just going, we, uh, yeah, you are, because what the, uh, uh, it, it, it seems that it's very complicated, but it's not, because what you are doing here is trying to, to, to apply uh, quantum gravity to a simple situation where you have a geometry which has uh, a background that does not depend on X and some small perturbations. These perturbations are considered just to be linear, okay? And in this situation, uh, these are just, um, there is no self-interaction, you see? There is no self-interaction. And not having self-interaction, then the things are much easier in quantum field theory. Now, when we consider uh, uh, non-linearities, or if you want to, if you go at higher orders in perturbation theory, then the situation becomes much more complicated, much more complicated. And then uh, the things that I think you are worried, worried, uh, we have to be, we have to be dealt with a lot of care. But here we have just a background which does not depend on X, so it's like uh, quantum mechanics of particles and a field which is free in the, in the sense that uh, the uh, Hamiltonian only contains uh, um, square terms, does not contain phi cube or pi cube, nothing like this, just contain square terms. Of course, Hamiltonian, there are terms in Hamiltonian which depend on time, and that's the, 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 and, and that's the, uh, the key feature of uh, this approach. In the Hamiltonian, for in the in the end, if I, I, the, in the end, the Hamiltonian uh, uh, is the Hamiltonian of a uh, 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 free field with a time-dependent mass. That's that's the problem. And in the situation, things are not so complicated. Then you can describe, you can define a wave function and all these things. But in the other situations, you are, when you consider other, uh, other, uh, uh, other orders of perturbation, then things are much more difficult. And that's why, and that's the origin of this non chances here. And that's something that you are involved with now, but it's much more difficult. I'd I, I, I like to show you uh, what I cannot do here, I don't know why. Uh, the, the, I don't know why. So anyway, okay, this. Yes. I'd like to show you the Hamiltonian in order for you to see that the Hamiltonian mm -hmm. for the uh, is just a Hamiltonian for free fuels with time dependent mass, okay? That's it. I think Matt, we can like, um... Stop recording um, at this moment because it's question answer session. Huh?